in in the closing of the world for the last couple of years, I got a chance to be with my children, you know, one of which is waiting a kidney transplant and had to be put on dialysis. So I really God have gotten you. a chance to be, yeah, God, thank you. I really have gotten a chance. He's 19. He, his body, he, he don't, he, he, well, he thinks he's um, Iron Man. Thank you so much for joining me today. You got the oh, legendary you, uh, Killer Mike. This is Mr. Michael Render, first and foremost. Uh, the world famous political activist, rapper, producer, songwriter, renaissance man. Um, you know, one of the few that's been around for 20 plus years, just changing the game and everything that he touches. I'm honored to call him a dear friend of mine, a mentor Absolutely. of mine an inspiration of mine. Um, so, uh, Mike, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today. Thanks for having me, Ari. I appreciate being here. I'm, as me and Shane are running around getting fitted for mayor's ball tonight. These are my highlights of the day, getting to hang with you and later the mayor. I'm blessed, man. I got a cool life. You know, you, you, you've built, you've built your life, right? I mean, like you, you've yeah. built, you've built that. I want to kind of get into, you know, a couple of those little things, because as you know, my, you know, my book coming out and the podcast is around this yeah. concept of the gift of failure. Right. And, yeah, yeah. and, when we were, we, and when we were chopping it up, you know, in Atlanta, you know, what was that a couple of months ago or whatever it was, you know, we saw, you know, very much eye to eye that there's all this flex, there's all this stuff. And, you yeah. know, gentlemen like you and I that had to build, you know, everything that we, have against you know against the odds you yeah more than yeah. you know anybody but you know in my own journey as well and so i wanted to you know kind of stay true to that a little bit and talk about a few um just a few issues that might have been seen as failures and yeah. how you navigated those and and one of them just because you know i you know i'm such a big fan of the music and you know i'm a music yeah. head like it kind of pains me that ooh la la didn't hit when it was supposed to, like when it was supposed to actually come out. Cause to me, that was like a number one record and run the jewels for, if I'm not mistaken, kind of dropped right around COVID, right? Like it kind yeah, of COVID, ha COVID happened. We went and shot a huge video for ooh la la, which um, was, we which was bananas. I mean, yeah, we, yeah, we were, we were scheduled to do, um, um Brian ability did it. It was dope video and he and his wife, we were scheduled to do two weeks of Coachella, both weeks of Coachella, and then go out on a world tour, march out on a world tour opening for Rage Against the Machine. And I came home, I went to my friend's father's funeral, and then I got sick for 14 days. I just, I literally was 14 days in my bed face down. Right around the time my, that all this is launching, like, like yeah. rains it pours kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. No one knew what it was. I, I still can't confirm it was COVID. I just know I got sick early enough before they even rolled out and say, oh, this is this thing called COVID. And as I was feeling better, we just saw the world start to say, hey, this this Corona thing, this, you know, it, it's coming, it's, this COVID thing is coming, and things should start getting knocked off the calendar. Tours start getting knocked off, Coachella canceled. And, you know, with that said, we didn't fail. The record still did great. The video made us a bigger group. We got tons of saints. Shouts out to Cadillac for you know, keeping our sinks on another couple of years, stuff like that. But in in the closing of the world for the last couple of years, I got a chance to be with my children, you know, one of which is waiting a kidney transplant and had to be put on dialysis. So I really God have gotten you. a chance to be, yeah, God, thank you. I really have gotten a chance. He's 19. He, his body, he, he don't, he, he, well, he thinks he's, um, Iron Man. He he's just doing what he does. He'll be good. But, He'll be good. He's got that whole. Exactly. He's got that holy aura. He's good. It, yeah. Shouts out the Pony Boy. Um, but it allowed me to be home and to be home with my children and really spend the time with them. The touring in my career had taken a, a lot away from you know. Um, my wife travels with me a lot, so you know she and I our bond was pretty solid. But it's become you know even better being able to just be home and be to ha experience some normalcy. So. I can even say even in this, the blessing of being able to connect with my family on a deeper level, whether it's my sisters or, you know, um, other family members that are getting up in age, you know, in their silver years, my 87-year-old aunt, I've gotten a chance to hang out with the last two years. So I can honestly say that 
you know, in the failure of the, you know, the, the world's health that I found a silver lining of really being able to be home and, and to be a dad and a father and a, you know, and to be in my community a lot more to help a new mayor get elected in Atlanta and things of that nature. So I'm very grateful. That's, I mean, that, that's amazing. You're always such a, such a positive influence in, in, in everything. You know, a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about, you know, just, you know, look, when we were at the height of Black Lives Matters, I mean, you came on TV that obviously, you know, everybody in the world saw it was a, you know, super viral. Um, and it's still hard for me to watch without getting emotional or even talking about it. But, you know, you single handedly, you know, lowered that that temperature gauge like things were so charged up and you know the authenticity of what you said the truth of what you said and getting on that stage you know walk me through you know because obviously black lives matter is a societal failure um of epic perform proportions that we even had to get to that level of that well, be, well, yeah. be a thing so i'm not a member of the organization gotcha. but the spirit of the organization that Black Lives Matter, because Black people are human beings. Black people are human beings with souls. Black people are human beings with family and connections. We're citizens, and that matters. So I want people that hear, you know, words that may be used for politically charged rhetoric to the positive or negative to understand that what I'm saying is that the human beings that are called, that have been called Black, Negroes, that have been called African Americans, Afro Americans, we're simply human beings. And anytime the state is abusive to any human beings is tyranny and it's evil. When one particular group in particular, if my father can have the same complaints about the state that I do, then we have not progressed in a, in a progressive enough way. Um, well, we I was hanging out. Yeah, we've digressed actually, but I was hanging out with Noriega, the rapper, my, my, my friend, and I was taking him to a food truck that T.I. and I own called Bankhead Seafood. Uh, a you got to tell us more did. about that too, because I know y'all are invigorating that new restaurant. Y'all are, yeah. y'all are on some major stuff. So we, hopefully we have time to get into that. Yeah, too. we'll talk about it. Absolutely. I was, I was, I was cracking bottles of champagne, eating fried fish and shrimp, um, smoking blunts. <laughs> you know, I wasn't smoking blunts, but Nori and the homies were. And T.I. called me and said, Hey, the mayor's office is calling because as it gets darker, the peaceful protests that were down at CNN are starting to turn dark. They think people are coming to the crowd that are there to do non-peaceful things, and they don't want regular citizens getting hurt. And I was like, "What? Well, she called the right person." <laughs> so, and, so um, Tip is the yeah. one that got the kind of the tip off, basically, and he's the yeah. one that called you because I know y'all have been best friends like for we a long time, right? Like nearly twenty years now. Yeah, but he was. We were in front of his studio, so, and we had the food truck there, and he got walked you. up to me. Yeah, I was just, he had just left the gym or something. I'm like, bro, I'm not going. <laughs> That's like, absolutely Because not. I can't imagine, even when you said, when you first walked up there, like, you know, expressing your, your manliness of like, I'm hurt, I'm angry. Like, like you, yeah. like you were, it was so vulnerable, but then going into the crux of that. So that actually was one of the things where they had to call you to yeah. go up and do something because they, well, they knew. Well, they called my friend. Yeah, and my friend called me because like, and yeah, they know, couldn't even get to you. They couldn't even get yeah. directly to you. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the mayor has my what has my has my phone number, but I think that she just knew and and Falana, um, God bless Falana out of her administration. I think they just knew this is one Mike doesn't want to be necessarily involved. But they also knew we're all from the same side of town. We're all from the same neighborhood practically. She knew that um she she probably knew that my friend could do some convincing. So after about an hour of trying to convince, Tip said, well, I'm not going if you're not going. And, you know, I know I need to go. And you don't let your friends walk in the battles alone. So, you know, when, when he said that, it was just like, all right, you trump carded me. Let's go. And um, we got in our cars. We went over there. And I jumped in the truck and headed over, got there. And as I walked by and I saw the mayor just being um, a, a decisive leader in terms of being firm and how she handled you know, you know, the police were ready to go in and, and, and put water on it really quickly to say, let's put this fire out. She was telling them to hold because she didn't want citizens hurt or injured. And then, you know, me, T.I. Joe Beasley, who's a longtime civil rights um, organizer um, and a man of prominence here in Atlanta, um, 
we all got up there and we all just said our piece. You know, we said what was in our hearts because we, we love this city. Atlanta has been a very special place for over 100 years for African Americans. It's not Wakanda. It's not perfect. It's because Wakanda is a fictional place. But if I've ever seen anything that's close to what Wakanda could be, if it were a real place, it's Atlanta, Georgia. There's tons of opportunity here tons. for people who are non-white. You know, I have friends here that are black whose families have been here for 100 years and more. My family's been here since 1950. It's so about 70 something, 72 years. Damn, We've that. been here. I have friends who have come, who have come from foreign countries who, who have, have been able to make, you know, their, their parents have come here and made a way. There, it is a, it is truly a city of opportunity. And I, and I value this city for that. As I travel the world about four or five times now, I know that people who often look like me don't have this opportunity. And I don't care if you're in Perth, Australia. I don't care if you're in the UK. You know, I don't care if you're in New York or Los Angeles. Sometimes there's just a lack of opportunity for people who look like me. Atlanta is the antithesis of that. There are tons of opportunity. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, you're going to fail some. Yes, it's not going to always work out. But when you get an opportunity, people value you for the work you bring and the content of your character. And you're, you're not so much based on their prejudices or preconceptions about what you look like or where you're from. And I value that about the city. So when I was speaking, what I was speaking is to that nature. When I was speaking to the nature of a city that could produce a Martin King, you know, I was speaking to a city that could produce the SCLC. I was speaking to a city that holds, you know, for the major black colleges in Morris Brown, Clark, Morehouse, and Spelman. I was speaking to a city where a rapper who sings and dances for a living sits on the board of the High Museum of Art. That's just a lot of, that's a lot of not, and uh, you know, you don't see that everywhere. In that's the world. culture. So very, I mean, that that's progress. I mean, that's that's the that's the epicenter of it. Like the way you're explaining, I, I I didn't really understand it as well as you're explaining it. So I'm really I'm really happy to learn that. That's actually very encouraging. Yeah. So it's it's, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. It was opportunity in nineteen, you know, nineteen or nineteen hundred through nineteen ten when W. B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington did the Atlanta conferences here. There was opportunity in the 30s when John Wesley Dobbs made sure that there was a black business district. And there was an opportunity here in the 50s when Dr. King started, you know, the civil rights movement here. There's been opportunity every decade in some way. And there's opportunity now in the economic upsurge that you see of black owned businesses. Black you already know I'm business. a real estate guy. So you already know I'm, I'm, I'm looking in the neighborhoods <laughs> as well to help, to help, you know, further some of that stuff. So you, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some of that, but on a much deeper level. And yeah. what, I, what, what I love about you too, Mike, amongst other things is aside from being the, the realest motherfucker, like <laughs> walk in this earth is like, you're so well educated and so well informed you know, beyond the scope of whatever. Cause me growing up, like I was listening to, you know, to Goody Mob and Dungeon Family yeah, and absolutely. like as a hip hop head. And like, there's this one persona of what like Killer Mike is for those of us that don't, you know, know. And I mean, winning Grammys with Outkast and like all the things that I'm sure, you know, people know as hip hop heads, but yeah. you know, it's such a breath of fresh air to listen to such an intellectual human being. And like you said, like, I'm like you, man, I'm, I'm colorblind to everything. I'm half Iranian, I'm half German. I just wanted to see, you know, really, you know, what, what it is. And what I'm hearing from you is more like lives matter. Like, you know, like meaning we're all the same. And it's like, well, like that well, equality, right? Matters. Like, like yeah, like sometimes people misinterpret, especially white folks, God bless their souls. They misinterpret colorblind as saying, well, I don't see color. Well, you do. You see what I look like. I see what you look sure. like. But but what what we acknowledge is character. I'm not going to acknowledge you or behavior. Based on, exactly. It, well, it, well, your your character determines your behavior. Correct. If you got shitty character, yep. you're going to have right. shitty behavior. That's right. That's right. You know, if you know, and and so when Dr. King said judge people by the content of their character, he didn't mean that you're not going to see a Negro standing across from you. At that time, they called him Negro. He meant that you're not going to judge me simply based on physical appearances. You know what I mean? You're going to judge me by the work that I do, by the way that I treat other human beings. You know, um, Muhammad Ali talked about not, he talked about, he, he, he watched the way people treated a waiter. Forget how you treat the restaurant owner. How do you treat your server? You know, I remember going by our custodian in elementary school and Frederick Douglass High School every day and speaking to him. And him speaking to kids, he was as respected as any teacher or administrator. 
he was called sir. He was answered yes, sir, or no, sir, because my grandparents and other parents in my community at that time taught you that you respected adults that treated you well, that weren't hurtful or harmful or abusive to you. So that's what my grandparents instilled in me. That's what my community instilled in me. And that's what I wish to see more of. And the only way you see more of that is that's what you, you act going in public. That's the way you grow your own children. That's where you grow your own family. So it's important that we acknowledge what we see. You know, I see it. I see an Iranian man before me. I don't assume him a terrorist. You know, I don't do that stupid shit they do on Fox News and things of that nature. You know, you see a handsome guy with a great haircut. You get to know him. You get to learn, wow, his character and interest is very much like mine. He sends your wife something cool from Tiffany after he meets you guys and your, your household is happier because you met a friend. You, and your you, you, like, you I know, like I love you all. Y'all, y'all are family <laughs> to me, man. Like, yeah. you, you know how much I love you guys. And, and, and hearing you talk is just there's just so many people that need to hear, you know, this, you know, really hear this, this message. And, yeah. you know, by the way, just as a quick, quick, quick aside, I was listening to Pop and Tags early, earlier today. And, and that, that verse is still, uh, that, 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 ver, that, verse, that verse is still, uh, is, is still bananas, by the way. And like yeah. I said, every, everybody who knows me, including Mike, knows I'm a hip hop head. And they might yes, think, man. what's this Iranian dude listening, knowing about hip hop, though? You know, like, <laughs> I always get, I always get shit for that. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's funny, right? Right now, like I, I see a lot of the things again from the outside in. I know the stuff that I know from you, obviously personally, you know as well. But you know what? What I've been seeing in the in the media is you know, and Tip are doing that stuff with the restaurant. You know yeah. that was, I guess, a failure at some point. Closed down. Y'all are reinvigorating it. Can you walk me through a little bit what the plan is there yeah. with the restaurant and like what's so the like what's going on there? There's a there's a 50 year old restaurant called Bankhead Seafood. Yep. It was owned by Miss Helen Hardy, and, and that's Ti's neighborhood. That's his original neighborhood. That Bankhead neighborhood is like his original. Where yeah, he we grew all up. we all grew up there. Y'all yeah. grew up in, in that Bankhead. Yeah, what what it is is the west side of Atlanta. Um, it's a culmination of neighborhoods: Center Hill, Grove Park, um, Collier Heights, Adamsville. All of this is the west side of Atlanta. It's the bottom of northwest Atlanta. Is that where is and that where Big Boy and Three Stacks and them are from? All no, is that the same? That's a no, different they're, side. They're from southwest Atlanta. They're from College southwest Park Atlanta. Got you. So, that's south of a highway called I twenty. So if you're looking at the screen, the bottom of the screen where you are would be southwest Atlanta. Got you. The top of the screen where I am would be the west side of Atlanta, and that's the bottom of northwest Atlanta. It's a pretty much all. It's a densely populated black um, section, and the, the section that I grew up in, which is T.I.'s neighborhood is here um, in, in Center Hill and Grove, Center Hill. My neighborhood is right here in the Collier Heights, and it's all the west side. Bankhead is at the top right here, and then Martin Luther King is south of. So our neighborhood Got is you. Okay, right now that was a perfect Bank. visual. Okay, that makes perfect sense now. So yeah. you and so Tip are really from very much closer communities than the rest of kind of the— We could walk to each other's houses. Got you. Got you. Okay. So we— um. One on the west side went to this neighborhood. There'd be a line outside. It's it's like one of those great little dive restaurants that you go to in any city that's off the that's off the beaten path. Um, the woman would give you uh, a box of fish you could barely close, and for five six bucks you could you know feed a Keisha um, Lance Bottoms, our current mayor. Her mom would send her there when she was working in beauty shops to feed the staff and things of that nature. And this woman was also a member of the same church. I was I was a member of growing up Mount Olive Baptist Church. But she just got old and she was like, I got to sell it. I'm going to close it down. My wife and I went two weeks before it closed, just to, for nostalgia's sake, ate some food. And then me and Tip were talking on the phone. Um, and I was like, you know, we got to do more than just publicly be friends. We got to do some business together. We have to do something to show. Yeah, I mean, y'all are the leaders the of the community. I mean, y'all are the, I mean, y'all are Atlanta to me. I mean, y'all are the voice. Yeah, we're home and we're homies. So people knew we were homies, but it's important to me that young people start to see, we should start doing business. And you're also together. business aligned, not just friends, Absolutely. not just, and Absolutely. also African American owners and the inspiration Absolutely. that that applies to everybody. And by the way, holler at your boy when you're buying real estate and doing yeah, real well, estate. I'm, what's listen, up? I'm, like, I, I, I didn't get the call. I was, I was, I was, I was waiting. I was waiting for the <laughs> for the message to be like, "Yo, me and Tip are doing this restaurant." Ari, what's up? You throwing some stacks in? You're gonna help us do the like? What's up? I'll, holler at your boy. Like, I'm I'm ready. I told Tip the same thing. He's developing a 143 unit um, retail and shopping, well, retail and, and living space just down the street. He bought the old grocery store and is building that. 
And I was like, damn, man, you could have called me about that deal. I would have figured it out. No, but, but I'm but I'm saying if he needs anything, cool. you let me know and you say, look, because I'm in there all the time and like meaning, you know, you know, I don't want anything for like, you know, you you know how more my heart is. But when you're going into my world, just like, you know, if I was going to be a rapper, which God forbid how bad it would be, I'd call you. But like if he's buying a shopping center, you're doing a restaurant like holler at your boy. Let me run some numbers. I'm let me holler. like call some banks, like save a couple of yeah, missteps and just just love like meaning like happen. let him know. Hit, holler at your boy like you got me like let me help. <laughs> the hollering's happening. Shane is actually. Um, Shane is actually taking one of the properties we own now and she, that's what she wants to develop into some affordable living. So the hollering is going to happen, Yo, it's, but I'm very, I'm very proud of him for doing that. But he calls me about a week later. He says, Hey, I got a, I got a call from, um, on Bankhead Seafood and you know, this is how much it's going to cost us to acquire it. There'll be some additional costs in terms of getting the actual recipes and things, but this is how, and I was like, Man, I was just going to buy Dodge Demon. He was like, well, you know, I told my wife about it. She was like, well, you know, uh, it's the second time you're not going to be able to buy a Demon. The first time was in a, um, um, a, part, a part, small apartment complex we bought. And this time it was a restaurant. So I still don't have a Demon, but I own a restaurant. We were, um, we were engaged by a man named Noel Khalil of the Columbia Group, who's a real estate developer. He met us on the mayor's transition team. Um, rest in peace. He, um, we buried him about a month ago. God bless the dead. He was huge in terms of helping mentor mentor us through. Um, we ended up doing doing a deal. We ended up pushing forward, buying a food truck, getting great advertising out there. And now we're going to open a restaurant. We're going to open a restaurant love it. so that people who live on Bankhead don't have to drive to Buckhead to have a nice time. You can go there after work. You can enjoy and it's a for, it's affordable. Bar. It's with, you know, yep. all the things Absolutely. that that fit in it's, and it's, it's profitable. Yep. Yeah, and the food is seasoned, unlike some other restaurants. Yeah, that's what so. I'm trying to say. I'm trying to have, I'm trying to have that good food, but you you let me yeah. know if there's anything there that I can Absolutely. see. And for you guys, like like y'all typically tour a lot. Like y'all y'all's yeah, tour schedules up. are banana. I'm saying in normal like yeah. crazy amounts of like y'all work. Shows. Last tour cycle, we did 123 shows in a year. That's it. To show every three days and, and people think about oh you did 123 shows but you know you may travel 10 hours to do a one hour show you know you may be you you may be in germany one day and then and the next day you're, you're leaving germany headed back to the continental the united states and australia that's so that's it takes grinding i mean that's like real wayne used to say you ain't grinding if you ain't tired that sounds yeah, like true. that sounds that's like true. that sounds like work that's true i mean i got eight hours of sleep last night it's up to luxury i don't know what to do yeah, you know, you, bro. Well, you you always you're always vibrant, no matter what. Like I said, every time that I spend time with you, I come away with this sense of energy of feeling full. You know, because as we all know, sometimes you're in those meetings or you're on social media, you get on this thing, and you feel like those energy vampires, like kind of taken from your aura, and you're always yeah. this, such a giving person in you know in everything that you do, you and your wife both, and. It's, it's a message that needs to be spread. You know, I, I was going to ask you, you know, just staying a little on point. I won't keep you too long because I know you're busy. Is a sense of, is there a failure that comes to your mind? And, and you know that I'm re-signifying what that means and thinking of yeah. it differently. But is there something that comes to your mind, whether early in your career, new, whatever, that was so big that leveled you? But now that you look back on it, you look at it differently, something that just comes to mind? Yeah, one of the, one of the best things that happened um, for me, I, I went gold in the atmosphere where rappers were going diamond, and that was perceived as a failure or a loss by me because you know, of course, you want to go platinum, you want to the world, you want. But the sound that I had on my first album was not mine, meaning I didn't understand or what I really wanted to sound like. the The persona of who Killer Mike was was not mine. It was in part created by my association with Outkast and the Dungeon Family. I didn't understand how to truly be me. Yeah, I was in the middle of the crunk era and me and Tip were the guys who were lyrically rapping down here in the in the middle of everyone with bass heavy music and, and, and chant like anthems, you know what I mean? So I it took me longer to figure out who I was and how I wanted to present myself. Now, if I had had a hit record right out of the gate in terms of on my own, 
I would have been married to that the rest of my career. How wow. do you make some incarnation that's of a, that? That's that's a jewel right there. Yeah. And did you and but did you have the time to un, like in the moment? Because for me, like when I have one of those haunting moments of failures, like in the moment, like I don't I didn't have the the mind or the intellectuality to understand it then how long did it take you to figure out yeah, that was a in jewel? the moment you're just sick to your stomach you're just dead you're just like <laughs> yeah, ill you just, you just want to throw right. up exactly and you and you kind of sit lay and you say okay what what what's happening you you say to yourself what's what's happening and how can I course correct and what I did for course correct was I left major labels I left Columbia um you know, thankfully, Big and Dre had a trap door to get me out of that. I was then offered a record deal um, by Virgin Records at the time. And I was, I was, you know, I was offered a, a sum of money over 100 grand. I think a Challenger, whatever, Charger, whatever the new car, Mopar, Dodge had out at that time. And I walked away from that deal. And I'll never forget walking away from that deal. And everyone thought I was crazy, you know, at the. Yeah, because that's real bread. I mean, that's real money. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm, I was just like, I can't, I can't give up the freedom for money again. I can't do that. Um, Preach. And I went on, say, I went say, on a say that one more run. time. Say that one more can't time, Mike, because that's, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a bar that, I mean, that's just, yeah. that needs to be drilled in. Say that one more time. Cannot if nothing else for me. Freedom for money. Cannot give up freedom for money. For me, freedom, it was, it was just not worth the exchange. And I remember my, a, a man who I use as counsel now, Daniel Kane, who's a dear friend. My wife and I use them um, in, in aspects, you know, and just, you know, keeping our butt out of jail. But uh, he said, I thought you were crazy at the time. I said, what they offered me, I make for a show now. And that's just my half. So, you know, what they offered me for, for albums in my career, I make just going out and working an hour, 20 minutes a night now. So I don't, I don't, you know, I said, and he, he says, you, you, you 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 bet right on yourself, and I said I knew I was betting right. I just didn't know how long it take. It took me it took me longer. It took I tell people all the time. It took me ten years to become an overnight success. Next year will be the tenth anniversary of rap music, which was the record when I partnered with L. L. Produced it. It really brought me out. That was ten Plus, years now. Ten years. You're making year, me feel old, man. I, that felt man. like yesterday. I, for me too. And I look around, and it, you know, I'm it's, I'm in a different place, in a different place, but different space, but. I can say the year before the record dropped, Rolling Stones highlighted a record I had called Ric Flair on Pledge 3. Pledge was my mixtape series. I pledged allegiance to the grind. Yeah, yeah I remember. I remember. Right. So Ric Flair placed in their top 50. We didn't have a publicist. No one pushed it on Rolling Stones. Someone over at Rolling Stones said, I like this record. I'm helping this kid get some visibility. Dope. And that's what gave me the energy and the want to keep going. And it, uh, oftentimes people see the success or the first initial thing that hits and say, man, I know you, you, you felt empowered. I know you were invigorated. I was on my butt still, but seeing that in the Rolling Stone, let me know you can't quit. You're not doing anything wrong. It's just about bringing attention to what you're doing right. The next year, L and I worked together. We got rap music out. He did Cancer for Cure. He dropped his album a week before mine. People were worried if our albums would cancel each other out. We said, cancel each other out. We're going on tour together. We went on tour together, left tour with a wider audience because we were both on each other's records. L had a record to turn in. He had a mixtape to turn in to a record company. He wasn't prepared with the mixtape. I said, don't worry. I'm going to fly with you. We'll do the mixtape together. He says, I already spent the money. I said, I don't care. I don't need any money. We're just going to do the mixtape together. And what that allowed us to do was I knew if we got the mixtape together, we could tour again. So at this point, oh, I'm leaving. So you chess moved that out. Like, so that was a chess move. I knew it. I was like, because, and I'm talking about we're touring at this point, just like, you know, three, 500, 600 people rooms. But I knew that if I can consistently stay on the road, we could grow the campaign. We do run the Jewels one. We open for each other. I open, L second opener, and then run the Jewels comes out. If our audience is our audience, the Killer Michael side of the audience is here. The LP side of the audience is here. And then there's these kids off to the side yeah. with like X's on their hands. So I know they're too young to drink. I come out, do my thing, kill a mic. Oh, LP comes out, does thing, LP, oh. And then we come back out together. And these kids that were like respectful doing our first two appearances see Run the Jewels as a group and they lose their freaking minds. And that's when I was like, oh shit, this is something new. 
this isn't just killing but my all, fans. But you've always done fans. that, Mike. Like in, in hindsight, they they'll, they're going to come back and look at some of these old records, and be like, oh, that was a sleeper. Oh, that was a sleeper. Or that was like you've always been like involved in those rooms of being on the cutting edge of changing how yeah. that sound is you all that, that's always been even when CeeLo was singing on some of those things even when like all those things that y'all have done ancillarily even with tip even, and i know you're in the room when the king's coming out when top back when all those things were happening but that's to me as a as a fan as a student of the game you've always been like crossing sounds, changing cultures, experimenting. Am I missing something? But it's always it's nice, felt like you've been doing that. Be, it's a blessing to be there. It's a blessing to, it's a, and that's the, the important part to me about not having envy and why not meism. You, it's important to, to, to rid yourself of envy and why not me. Say that again. Please say moment. that again. Man, avoid envy and why not me. Those are two poisonous emotions. It's a blessing to be in the room with success. Tip being one of my best friends and being an absolute hit maker has been one of the best things in my life. I remember when I told him, I said, man, thank you for letting me come over to Grand Hustle and giving me an opportunity to drop pledge, you know, over here because being associated with you guys has helped me. He said, Kill, you could have been over here. All you had to do was ask. So I didn't understand that you should and could ask. You know, it wasn't that I didn't that I didn't understand that it would help me. I was like, man, my friend's doing his thing. He got a list of other artists. Yeah, now, like you didn't friends. think in your mind that like I just need to open my mouth and just say something. Exactly. And 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 I laughed and we give I said, Well, I won't make that mistake again. And and hence, you know, we've not only went on to make music together since, we went on to become business partners and a in a deeper cut of friends. But I've learned so much along the way. I don't regret it. I don't. The last 10 years of my life has been the most prosperous financially. But the financial prosperity comes from the life lessons I have learned. And that authenticity continuing to evolve, right? Because I just see, I just see it more and more. And like every, everybody's everybody's watching at, at, at this point. I mean, it's it's you know, I watched um uh tip on your on your show the other day which was yeah love and respect yeah and it was it was it was beautiful man like i mean just hearing him i mean such an intellectual man obviously had a lot of things that he's dealt with you know in in his own life but but that man's i remember when i'm serious first dropped and like just listen to that sound and like yeah you know you know i'm a student of the game so i'm watching that happen but be able to continually evolve um, into these different roles as well, into acting and all those different things. But knowing that, you know, you know, a man like you, that is a Renaissance man to me, like, that's the way, like someone asked me, that. you know, about you, you know, the other day, you know, something came up and passed. It was like, Oh, it was with, you know, with a dear friend of mine. And they said, so what do you think about him? And the first thing that I said was he's a Renaissance man. I didn't know any other way that. of, explain like what am i going to say he's a political activist, he's a philanthropist he's doing this he's making music he's having kids he's open up restaurants he's making great music like i didn't know what to, like to me that was the only way i could describe you of just that just a renaissance man that's truly affecting change and you. um you know you have all my love all my respect anything you guys are doing um that you know i can help in any way shape or form you know i'm always here for you all in any way and and i I don't want anything other than to see you all forward that mission and keep moving the world forward and if i can be you know one little piece of slightly you know saving a misstep you know that you know that i'm there well i'm definitely hollering man I, i i just appreciate i appreciate you for not only being a fan and a friend but being a person that has helped me understand finance i want to say to to my community it is important that you ally into all people, that you befriend people who are not from your cultural background, that are not from where you're from geographically, that are not of your race or ethnicity, because we have so much cross-culturally to learn and to teach each other if we'll simply base it in friendships. If we'll plant that acorn, it'll eventually grow into an oak tree if properly cared for. And we have to believe that. We have to come out of our perspective corners and to start to engage one another. This country is, you know, they used to say it's a melting pot. It's not a melting pot. Because in a melting pot, everyone kind of loses This is like identity. a quilt. It's you like a come, quilt. It, they it's all a like, quilt. Now, I, I tell people all the time. It laid on top of each so, other. It never mixed the way it should have. Well, this country's not a melting pot. 
because you lose yourself in a melting pot. Everything just gets boiled down to whatever they're melting into. And but what this country really is, it is a quilt of different fabrics, of quilt. different of different materials, and there takes people from each fabric to act as a thread to sew that quilt together. I still have the 50-year-old quilts that my great, or 30-year-old quilts, 40-year-old quilts that my great-grandmother stitched right next to me. She used some of my blue jeans as material, some of my sister's dresses, some of my grandmother's old fabrics, and they're the most valuable piece of items in my house because I saw her stitch these things together. You would have never thought they should go together. And what I see in this country now is everyone takes their scraps this way, everyone takes their scraps materials this way, and they're say, well, I don't have enough material, I'm cold. But if we sew that quilt together, there'll be enough warmth for all of us. If we, if we begin to cooperate, I'll never forget hearing a story. I don't know. I was reading in um, an English class in high school about a stone suit. There was a town that was starved. It was doing some war. There was a big ball of water. Someone started boiling. They put a stone, stone in it. Then someone came and put a carrot in it. Then a tomato. Next thing you know, it was meat in it. And next thing you know, the whole town could eat because someone had, everyone had contributed something. And that's how I view this oh, country. America is a beautiful place when we're all contributing to one another to make our community better. It is a better place when you befriend people who don't look like you, people who are not of your racial ethnic background, people who are not of your religious background, people who don't believe the same things as you. It gives you an opportunity to grow because at our core, human beings all want love. We all want respect. We all want an opportunity for future generations to have it easier and not have the same hardships we have. They'll have their new hardships to conquer and fight. And I truly believe that's the way. I think we need more of this, not less of this, to be the best potential country we can be and world to be, to be honest. I don't think any truer words have ever been said. Um, I got, I mean, you know, I could talk to you for forever. I always learn something every time we talk. But I got one question for you. You know, as we kind of, you know, put a wrap on this and I know yeah. we have a million more conversations to come, but Absolutely. if there was one thing that you wish everybody in the world knew, what would that be? How valuable they are. You, that person that you look at in the mirror every morning, is a house of God. Whatever you believe in terms of a greater spirit or architect of the universe that has put us here is not outside of you. That being rests in your heart, mind, soul, and body every day. And it rests in the person across from you when you're at lunch. It rests in the children that you see go to school. It rests in the people you may or may not agree with. But truly, every human being is a house of something holy. And you first and foremost should treat yourself that way. And you, when I do this in pictures, people say, you'll do this. Well, I do this to let myself know that. Put yourself first. Take care of yourself. You can't take care of anyone else about you. But I'm always Amen. under the umbrella of God. I'm always under the umbrella of a grander creator. So if anything, I want people to know you, just as you are, as imperfect as you are, are a high and holy being. And you deserve to be treated as such. And all you owe the world is to treat others in such, in such a way as well. So beautiful, Mike. Love you, brother. Love you, brother. Love to everybody in the family. Send my love Thanks. to everybody. Um, and let me know whatever I can do, little, little or small. You, you know that I'm always here for you. Thank you so much for taking the time. And um, this is valuable things that everybody needs to hear. And uh, we're going to definitely share it with them. And I'm going to be coming down to see you in Atlanta sooner than later. And please I'll bring the family soon. to Austin. Get down here. Let's spend some, let's spend some quality time and, we're, we're uh, and chop it up. Absolutely. Love and respect you, brother. All love. Talk to you later, man.